Hello, and welcome back to Open Relationships Transforming Together. I'm your host, Andrea Miller, joined by our producer, Brian Atkins. Joanna Schroeder, my co-host, is out today. We have a parenting ninja on the show today, Destiny Ann Davis. So if you have kids, whether they're older or younger, that are easily dysregulated, that are are challenging, that aren't listening, that you kind of feel like, oh my God, why is my kid so rude? Um, that you just feel like, oh, what do I do? Somebody help me. I got good news for you. We are here to help. Destiny Ann is here to make parenting better for you and your family. So I am excited to introduce our guest, Destiny Ann Davis. <laughs> oh my gosh, Destiny Ann Davis. I am so excited to have you on our show. Welcome. Destiny Ann is a certified parenting coach, the author of the very wonderful book, Very Intentional Parenting. She is a successful TED Talk presenter, the host of the podcast, Bitch, You're Doing a Good Job, a superstar on social media with millions of engaged fans and followers, and is a truly super mom to two daughters. Welcome, Destiny Ann. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, no, our team is pretty obsessed with you. Okay. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, big time. We'll we'll try not to fangirl out here too much. Um, Okay, so let's just get into it. So some people describe your parenting style as no discipline. Is that accurate? That's crazy. That's so crazy. That's crazy. I hope by now they're not still saying that good guy. Need to yell it from the rooftops. Absolutely not. I think that's so dangerous to, I mean, that's neglectful parenting is what that is. If we don't have any discipline, that's neglectful parenting. Um, and that's permissive parenting. And I was a permissive parent for years. So I'm like, I take offense. I have done the work, honey, to not be in that space. I have seen the impacts. And when people say that, I'm like, yeah, I absolutely agree. You're right. That is not a good way to parent. And that's not what's going on here. That's not what I'm doing. That's not what gentle parenting is. That's not what intentional parenting is. Um, But yeah, I think when, because the focus is typically on just discipline, anytime somebody sees a 60 second video talking about anything else, they just kind of fill in the blanks and assume that discipline isn't also happening. But I think that there is space and it's really important right now for us to be talking about how to have compassion with our kids, how to respect our kids, how to treat them like humans. Um, I don't want to just talk about discipline all day because that's what we've been talking about. And it's not getting us, it's not, it wasn't getting me where I wanted to be. And it's not getting the parents in my community where they want to be. The biggest challenge for a lot of parents is the emotional side of it. We're all in the rationalizing and what we're saying and doing. And there's a lack of embodiment, a lack of attunement to emotional experience. And so that is why that is the majority of what I talk about. But that's not all that I'm doing. Yeah, no, I, I've spent a, a lot of time with your materials, and it, it is interesting to me. And we'll we'll definitely get back into the nuances and how it works and, and why it works. But I'd love I'd love to go back to your early days. And I'm going to say you broke my heart um, watching your TED Talk and then just bits of your book where you talked about you were the, the bad child, the bad oh, teen, man. the bad adult, that there wasn't safety for you. I, I just... I'm curious, how did you go from all that bad and all those labels to where you are now? What, you know, and I, I'm, I'm sure that like big picture therapy, but like, was there a moment or was there something really specific that opened it up for you? Mm, that definitely was my experience. That was the label that I had and I was parented as the bad child. Um, and I moved into adulthood and realized that that behavior was not working, that I was getting negative results from that behavior, but I I didn't see anything else. I didn't know anything else. And so I, like most people, went down the path and the journey of self-help and reading all the books and the how to talk to people and da 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 And on the outside, I was able to present very well and I was able to problem solve. The challenge is when you have children, they're around you. 24 seven, there is no masking. There is, there's you, if you're not embodying the tool, there's no escape, (laughs) There's No escape. There's no escape. And you're going to experience the highest level of conflict 
with children <laughs> that you've ever experienced. And so I could not hold it together. And I was like, well, I know what I don't want to do. I don't know what I actually want to do. And so that set me down another path of, okay, now it's not self-help. Now it's parenting help. And again, I'm doing all the tools and I'm, I have all the communication scripts and all of that. But we didn't have the relationship that I genuinely desired. And so Meaning this we, was- a- we, you with your, do- your oldest daughter? And, yes. and how old was she about at this time? Um, This was almost four years ago. So she's 11 now. Yeah. So I was like, what's going on? Why is it that the tools that I think are working are working because her behavior is different, but her self-esteem looks just like the bad kids did? Like, how did we how did we wind up here? I'm doing something different. So was she so just to help me understand, you were using the tools, but she was still exhibiting those bad, bad bad girl habits oh my god that must have been so painful for you what <laughs> I'm, I'm like what the heck do we do now yeah i'm doing I mean, all the right stuff uh-huh i'm doing all the right stuff you you feel about me the way i felt towards my parents you feel about yourself the way you felt toward that way i felt towards myself what is wrong like what is going on and oh that's when i started my work um with jai jai institute for parenting and that's when i realized this is about me. If all of this stuff is unresolved, any tool I use is just going to be another form of coercion, even if it doesn't look like the tools that my parents use. Hang on. Another form of what? Coercion. Coercion. Okay. I love this. Okay. There's a lot to unpack here. So talk, I, I am a little familiar with Jai, but talk about that, what Jai is and how it helped you, if you don't mind. Yeah. Jai Institute for Parenting. So it's where I got my parent coach certification And their philosophy is 100% parent-centric. And it is very much about focusing on yourself, increasing and expanding your self-awareness so that you can show up attuned, present to whatever the parenting situation is. And that was a big shift (laughs) for me because I was so child-focused because I felt like nobody was focused on me as a kid and my needs and what I was feeling. So if I just focus on my kids' feelings and I focus on meeting her needs, then everything's going to be fine. Not realizing I'm not doing this from a resourced place. Right. It's almost like you go through it mechanically, right? Like you're almost going like you're trying like you're. And by the way, I can so relate because I've done the same thing where it's like you're trying so effing hard. And to me, no. that's what ends up making it that much more um, just soul sucking is you're trying so hard. But it's almost like coming from your your head a little bit and and mm-hmm. just a willfulness but, but that's also why it's doomed to failures. And that's what I feel like I hear you saying. Yes, literally that, that it was coming from, first of all, it was coming from fear that she was going to wind up like me, that she was going to feel like me. Um, and, because yeah, you're but awesome, then like, but you, oh, struggle, like, you. you obviously struggled. I struggled, yeah, yeah. <laughs> for sure. There was such a shame story. And then it was also coming from a place of, it was kind of reactionary. Like, I don't want to be like my parents. So I'm going to do the opposite. And in doing so, like I said, she wound up experiencing some very similar things. And so that was an opportunity for for me to step back and say, okay, if I keep ignoring me and what I experience, this is not going to work. This is this is not going to work. It allowed me to have grace for my past experience as well, Well, because I was like, I was going to ask you about that. You talk about how your mom was your best friend and you're so gracious about them because reading between the lines, not even reading between the lines. I mean, you make it really clear how much you suffered and you just said shame. And yet there's this incredible graciousness. Your mom passed away. Mm -hmm. Did you ever reconcile things with her? I mean, was she ever able to see how she let you down? So, no, we had a lot of conflict um, but my mom, again, was so focused on me in her own way, very external. I need to make sure she's successful. I need to help her. Da, 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 da. So we kind of always reconciled our actual conflicts. But the deeper piece, no, we did not. We did not get to. But I, I will say that we had really good, a really good repair process. And so things would happen. But she took accountability and we were able to move through them. Um, 
she was more of the permissive parent. <laughs> so maybe it doesn't land in the same way. Um, but that's why I have grace because I'm like, whoa, I was, I was there. I could not handle the anxiety that comes up when your child is misbehaving or when your child is frustrated or angry. So I kind of would just be permissive and it's fine, whatever, just do what you want to do to avoid the anxiety that I was feeling internally. So I think that there was a lot of that happening for my mom. So it's, I guess it's easier for me to have some grace for her in that do sense. You, because, do you forgive yeah. her for what, what yeah. you went through? Absolutely. I forgive her. I mean, my dad was definitely authoritarian. I forgive uh-huh. him. We have a is good he, relationship now. Is he still now. alive? Yeah, we have a good relationship now. Um, he has a different relationship with my kids than he had with me. Um, but that was a process and it required me being able to set boundaries, him being able to set boundaries. And so I absolutely forgive my parents. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Did Do you think your mom and dad saw you I mean you described yourself as a black sheep and that is such I mean that's not how I identified but others that I'm close to do it's such a triggering and terrible like so I love that you talk I say there's a golden sheep now (laughs) oh yeah (laughs) right exactly I'm the golden sheep would they do you think they would identify as do you think they would get if you said hey yo I I was the black sheep and you guys kind of perpetuated that do you think they would have that would they own up to it, do you think? Or could they see that? Um, I think that my dad has now. Yeah, I didn't get to have that conversation with my mom. Um, but I think that with it's not my responsibility to have the appropriate communication. I don't think it's the child's responsibility to learn the best way to communicate it. But I will say that the way that I'm able to communicate since forgiving my dad, the way that I'm able to communicate my experience, he is more receptive of it. I love that. And I've had a similar experience. It's like when you're in in pain and judgment, it's amazing how people aren't very receptive. Ooh, right. Yeah. Versus coming with with more empathy and open heartedness. It is I've had the experience in, in a number of important relationships where my doing my work um, enables me to show up and and kind of create the um the the foundation for a repair and even if it's not an overt repair but but it's a game changer in terms of the the you know the energy and rather than it continually feeling like you know people are jockeying for position or having to be protective it just feels like there is an openness would you say that that's been your experience at least with your dad yeah i mean i can very clearly remember the conversation and the conversation was hey dad like moving forward I can commit, if you can commit, excuse me, if you can commit to not treating me like the bad kid, I can commit to not treating you like the bad parent. Oh. Those were Snap. You said that? Yes. And how did he <laughs> respond? I feel like he probably felt that way. And, and I never even connected the dots of, he probably was having an internal experience watching my behavior. There there was probably shame there and his efforts to try to correct it and fix the behavior were probably because of the massive shame he felt witnessing my behavior he felt like a bad parent i know that he did because of conversations and so that is why i leaned into that like i'm not gonna treat you like the bad parent in in our conversations in our experiences I need you to not treat me like the bad kid. When I say something, I need you to not hear the, it through the funnel of destiny's bad. Oh my God. I'm And vice versa. Tears. I mean, oh, good for you. When did you have that conversation? This was probably two years ago. God, good job, mama. I mean, After I started pausing and looking at myself and yeah. Yeah. Well, but And I love that because when I think about um, how you were able to have that conversation in a way that was constructive because you looked at yourself, right? And I feel like mm-hmm. that's where there's often a disconnect. And whew, I feel like, you know, between on the show and my own life and friends and family, I, I feel like there is so much hurt and heartache out there and so much blame, right? And and I feel like inherently so many of us well-intentioned people end up making ourselves the victims. And I yeah. feel like it's such a place of of disempowerment. It's like there's nowhere to go. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I agree. And I, I think that 
in being able to pause and really understand, well, where are my behaviors coming from? I was able to address those needs and those emotions and not necessarily get those needs met for my dad. Just like I don't need to get those needs met for my kids in the moment. And when I can do that for myself, I have access to those tools in a more embodied way. And I think that that's what happened in that conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, congratulations. That's amazing and brave. And what a gift to give your daughters and him. I mean, I feel like, yeah. I mean, I'm a very intentional parent of two boys. As I told you, they're 11 and 14, greatest kids ever. And it's a lot. And I feel like it's very humbling when you have such high intentions as a parent and then you screwed up and then you screwed up and then you screwed up again. And it's just <laughs> like, oh my God. So what do you do when you screw it up? Because I mean, we all do, we, you know, wh what's that like for you? When I mess up in my parenting, do you mean in terms yeah. of the fact that I screwed up for years or just I mean, in general? Both, day honestly, day well, honestly, I both, up? you know, and yeah, I mean, honestly, both. Like, do you like, do you feel a lot of guilt? Like, I mean, I, I, on the one hand, you don't know what you don't know. And if you're like me, mm -hmm. it's like, well, shit, I still should have done better, even if I didn't know better. Right. I mean, do you, do you yeah. feel like that? Yeah, I definitely experience guilt. Um, I don't experience shame as much anymore. Yeah. And so there was a big shame story about how I parented her initially. And um, I really did have to release that. But the repair of that was me taking responsibility for that. Me not blaming her, me meeting with her where she is developmentally has been really, really important and not having expectations of her that I did not support and develop. Um in terms of when I make mistakes now, just like on a day to day, I'm very intentional about calling it out, not just saying sorry. For me, repair is about creating safety and expressing how I'm going to move forward. Um, letting them know that they didn't deserve the behavior is really important to me. That's not something that I experienced. Like, I, don't, <laughs> I didn't hear, I'm sorry. Few of us I did. Didn't yeah, yeah, no, hear few of us repair. Did. But it in, has impacted the way that they show up to repair and the way that they take accountability and the way that they're able to be empathetic. And it's a system in our home and we're both respecting and challenging each other. And it's a really beautiful thing. So it wasn't you, like that all the time. you share an example? What does it look like? You know, when when you screw up, like what where do you typically screw up? And then how does that how does it sort of sound and go down? Oh, my thing that I still struggle with is lecturing. <laughs> that is my, it, it's lecturing. The thing about our culture and dynamic is that she knows it's not okay. I think that's one of the biggest pieces that parents miss is that you have to be willing to tell your children that a behavior that you do is not okay. Because if you don't, it's so easy to gloss over it. So when I lecture and she checks out or tunes out or or tells me like mom you're lecturing I have to pause and I have to go inward and I have to calm whatever part of me is needing her behavior to change right this second because that piece is what's making it so easy to lecture so typically that'll look like you're right give me a second and I'll go in my room and I'll go take a shower I'll go into sensory deprivation and turn the lights out and <laughs> air earplugs and all of that, whatever I have to do to resource so that I can calm down. Once I've done that, that's me coming back and saying, hey, you're right. I wasn't handling that correctly. Can we try again? And so with lecturing, I think a lot of people might go, well, wait a minute, like, like, that's not that bad. So talk to me about lecturing. And by the way, it's like, that is, I feel like, one of the things that I screw up the most, and it's so hard. But but talk a little bit about that, because I think a lot of people would say, well, if you're not yelling, you're not spanking, they're not listening, like, how do you get through to them? So what what's so insidious about lecturing? Well, a few things. Number one, like, I no, lecturing is not that bad. And at the same time, like, I don't want to practice not that bad parenting, right? That's number one. <laughs> but the other half of that is that, I think that if I'm talking, I'm not listening and I can't teach my child how to ultimately when they're misbehaving beneath the behavior, there is an unmet need. 
I cannot teach my child an effective way to get that need met if I don't even take the time to understand the need, if I don't take the time to hold the mirror up to them so that they can see the need. That's what's most important. And so I try to move into the, the situation as this is an opportunity, not for me to discipline or teach you or force something down your throat. This is an opportunity for me to help you expand your internal compass so that you can make a good decision. I'm here to support you to make a decision, not to make you make a decision. And so when I look at it from that compass, if I'm lecturing, especially when we lecture and we know they're not listening, it is entirely about you soothing yourself in this moment. You know it's not landing, you know they're not receiving it, and you know that any problem solving is getting further and further and further away, but yet you're still doing it. And you're doing it because of the same reason that my dad was authoritarian. You're doing it because you feel something about your child's behavior and you want that feeling to go away. (laughs) And you are literally talking, verbally processing, and you feel better. You feel like a good parent. When they did, when they talked back, when they slammed the door, you felt like a bad parent. But now that I'm taking charge and command and I'm speaking and saying all these words that sound good, now I'm starting to feel like I'm parenting. I'm starting to feel like I'm doing a good job. But we're actually missing an opportunity for our children to learn from the moment. And so sometimes it is good to step away, take the pause, and come back so that we can return to problem solving. Mm -hmm. But what happens when your child has been extraordinarily rude or even abusive in their in their language, and you know, I don't want to presume anything about your daughter, but as an eleven year old, you know, I have an eleven year old myself. Can get spicy. Yeah, the, uh, spicy. And so, what do you do in those times when their behavior is just abhorrent? It's the opposite, right? Look at her. Look at the the spicy talk as my lecture. We're dysregulated right now, so I'm going to initiate a pause. The other day, um, she was getting what's, I guess, spicy for her now because a lot has changed, but she was getting spicy. And I just said, okay, I'm going to go take a shower. I don't know what she did in her room. I don't know if she was in a color in talking. I don't know what she did, but I took my opportunity to calm down. She had an opportunity to calm down and she came in my room and apologized. So it's about creating space between the action and trying to move into the logical parts of our brain to do the right thing. And so if our children are being spicy or if they're saying something rude, they're not thinking logically. So trying to logic them into not doing it is not the right right way to do it. We really have to go into the emotional room with them. Sometimes that looks like empathy. And me, again, showing them what's under her behavior. So communicating back to her what she's really trying to say. She's being spicy. I hear you. You're hungry. Is that that what's going on? Yes, I'm hungry. You can just say that. You can just say that. But if I get caught up on the behavior, she's not understanding a better way to communicate it. And I think that that's what happens is that we are offended. We are taking it personal. And we need them not to do that. But we're not teaching them something else to do. And so you said you you discovered the Jai Institute about four years ago? Mm-hmm. And so how long were you um, in that process before you started to see the change in yourself that led to the change in, in the relationship with your daughter? Oh, it was very immediate. <laughs> oh, hey. I like that answer. Yeah. So does everybody. Like, come on, give me that. <laughs> it was mm-hmm. very quick because I always say it's like putting on self-awareness glasses and you start to see something that you you can no longer unsee it. Like, if I am saying no arbitrarily now, that voice is automatically going off in my head saying, why did you say no? Was that your ego? And that's something that I happened initially because the first 12 weeks of that program is just focusing on you, your triggers, your needs, your values, what's important to you. Um, and so, yeah, it that part happened very quickly. Obviously, the application of it took time, but no, the, the glasses were put on and I could see myself and my behavior and where those things were coming from very quickly. What motivated you to go to the Jai Institute? The coaching that I was doing and the parenting that I was doing did not 
feel embodied. It was very much just like tools and okay, so now what's the next tool? Okay, so now what's the next tool? That didn't work. What's the next tool? Well, what if they don't do this? What if they don't do that? And I started to see, not just in myself, but in clients as well, a disconnect from their intuition. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, okay. Yeah. So when you say they weren't embodied, it was back to this idea of that, that mm-hmm. you were applying them kind of mechanically, but it, it, there was some, some, something wasn't internalized. And so it was, yeah. it seems like what you're saying is that it was kind of just superficial and as a result, not as effective. Yeah. Would, what would you say the number one thing you just talked about, I think self-awareness classes, was there one thing in those first 12 weeks that made it so much more obvious to you how, how you needed to change to apply all the, you know, all the tools as a, as a mom who was so committed to doing it differently with your own kids? Uh, yeah. So we talked in those 12 weeks a lot about nervous system science and emotional regulation. And that's probably the biggest piece of it for sure. Ner- okay. And, and so break that down because a lot of people don't know what nervous system science or, or, you know, regulation. So what does that mean? I mean, how would you use those things as a as a parent really trying to kick ass with your kids? Yeah. So me being able to be self-aware of when I am in a reactionary state, being able to recognize what's happening in my body, not just walking around unconsciously responding to triggers all day. That is fight or flight. That's And so putting those self-awareness glasses was, okay, when my daughter just talked back, instead of what's the nonviolent communication thing today to say, what just woke up in me? Like, is my chest starting to get hot right now? Like just pausing, hold on, what am I believing about her? Like, am I starting to have a bad kid narrative for her? What am I believing about myself? Oh my God, am I believing that if a kid talks back to me that the, I'm a bad parent? Because if, I'm, if I am, I'm going to put all all forces towards making this stop right this second, right? Um, the self-awareness of what I'm needing right now Am I exhausted? Am I needing my voice to be heard? Is that where this response is coming from? And if so, it's not coming from my values. It's not coming from an embodied place, an embodied space. And it's not going to be an effective tool. And by effective, I mean that it's going to be come off as a punishment. It's going to come off. She's going to have a negative association with this. I could be, I could put in the prettiest package. But if my energy is off, it's going to be received as a punishment. So I can make it maybe practical, if you like, with an example. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, so um, let's say that my daughter talked back to me. And she was talking back and I recognized, or I didn't recognize what was up. I didn't recognize what was going on. I'm just instantly triggered. I might yell, I might shut down, I might say, I'm not going to let you talk to me like that. So you come and find me when it's over. Versus, hold on, let me check in, do all the things that I just said to you. I might be able to lead with curiosity. Where's that coming from? Why are you so frustrated? How can I support you? Right? Because when I start there, now she can calm down. Now we can have the clear conversation. And neither of us are triggered in the process. I think what scares parents is, well, but you didn't say anything about the behavior. You didn't correct the behavior, da 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 And so my response to that is that something that has been powerful for us, not just pausing in the moment and ignoring the behavior essentially and meeting the need, but pausing afterwards to be able to have powerful, impactful recap conversations. That is when I do majority of the discipline. Like that's when that happens. And so I might come back and recap, hey, earlier, when you responded like that, that didn't really feel good to me. Like I can express all that stuff that I tapped into. That didn't really feel good to me. I didn't, I didn't really appreciate that. I don't think you would appreciate that either. How can we respond differently next time? We don't have to discipline and change our kids' behavior right in the moment. We need to be focused on where the behavior is coming from so that we can help them meet that need. Because when that need is met over time, the behavior goes away without the force, without the coercion, and what without the disruption of emotional safety. Mm-hmm. What kind of evidence is there that says that that works? 
you have any? Yeah, absolutely. If you prefer the label authoritative parenting, so to speak, that's the evidence of this. There's way too much research on the impact of our regulation and co-regulation. That's essentially what this is. So for instance, um, at the beginning of our call, like I just did this, I started dancing. And what did you do? You did the same. Ex- oh, did you I? Did the same I'm, thing. Like, I'm yeah, sure I moved. Did the same, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, you yeah. Did okay. The same exact thing. And so that is mirror neuron. That is our yeah, exactly. And so the in the the intentional act of showing up and modeling and being the environment is what's well researched. Okay, and so to people, I think there was a really good. Um, TikTok that you did that people were, I think, um, um, questioning um, gentle parenting not working in the real world. And you took exception to that. So does it work in the real world? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Like the authoritative, so to speak, parenting style is the part that is researched, which is that we don't just have high expectations, but there is also high support and that there is high compassion. And so when you put those two things together, you have a well-rounded adult, but you also have well-rounded children that are able to be in different environments, able to adapt, able to practice, um, what is the word? Able to practice situational appropriateness. Absolutely. So just because, I th- put it this way, our teachers aren't spanking our kids, right? But they still are able to get them to be collaborative, cooperative, whatever it is in the classroom. The, the two do not mimic whether you are authoritarian or permissive or you're gentle parenting. There's a school culture and there's a home culture. And the idea that because I don't parent the way that teachers teach means that my kids are not going to be able to function in school is just, it doesn't apply in any of our homes and in any of our situations. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it, it is interesting to me. I mean, because it used to be so much more about command and control, right? And, and corporal punishment. And I look at at our society and there's a mental health crisis and there's a loneliness epidemic and there's a a going no contact uh, epidemic with a lot of adult children to their parents. So I'm with you when it comes to, well, you know what? Um, It's almost like you can't prove a negative, but when you look and see how much hurt and heartache and trauma our society has endured using that more either authoritative or permissive approach, I feel like you can say, well, we know a lot of what doesn't work, right? Mm-hmm. And your, you know, your point about your intentionality about um, what would make, you know, I feel like you can make that logical case for, well, doesn't it seem like it's going to work better because it's going to teach kids, you know, kind of almost um, intrinsically, you know, to um, to to problem solve and those kinds of things. Um, but I, you know, I just it feels like there's. There's a lot of more than even doubt. It feels like there's like derision and even hostility to gentle parenting. Do you have you experienced that? Um, I think that that comes from maybe people utilizing the term inappropriately and sharing permissive parenting under the label of gentle parenting. Mm hmm. Um, going back to labels, you describe how you have ADHD. I am wondering do you feel like ADHD is a label that um, is causing more help than harm or more harm than help? I mean, especially with kids, because there are a lot of kids that are saying, I got ADHD. Yeah, I think that any label can be negative. I think that the way that in which a parent is using the label is what makes the difference. So when I say I have ADHD, the label was freeing for me because I had all these symptoms and all of these things happening and I couldn't figure out why. And because I couldn't figure out why, I was reaching for so many tools that just were not helping. So for me, and in that sense, ADHD was helpful because I was able to get resources specifically related to that label. I think that if the label becomes a reason to, um, to be permissive, or to be authoritarian, then I think that that is when it becomes an issue. So what you believe about that label as a parent is going to direct how you show up to the child with ADHD. So what what would you and and that makes sense. And let me let me actually make actually make sure it makes sense. So 
it, it almost feels like you're saying like if you're if you're the black sheep or the bad kid by definition those are bad things versus saying haiti like adhd it's not good it's not bad it just is what it is are you saying right that using that label it, it there's not a judgment or a stigma and it. it's just a a way to explain something yeah absolutely because i mean my label another label that i had in childhood was dramatic like you're so dramatic you're being so dramatic in my household like that's a that's a positive thing like that's a good that's a good thing like we love the drama so it really is not just the label itself i know that the bad kid label 100 percent was meant to be a negative thing was meant to be a shameful thing but what do you well, so what do you advise parents in part when i think about adhd yes there's a, a label situation there's also a, you know, when I think about those behaviors, being impulsive, um, not getting things done. I mean, in a lot of ways, there there are real consequences. So do you do you advise parents specifically who have children with ADHD? Do you, you know, does gentle parenting still apply or, or, or what do you advise for parents with kids with ADHD? I mean, yeah, knowing I, it, there's no it. stigma, but there is still real, you know, it's like a kid's really you know, breaks a window or, you know, behaves really impulsively, you know, that that's a problem. Yeah. So that comes back to the idea of we have boundaries and we have expectations, but it's about developmental appropriateness. And so being willing to say that it's not about where my child is in terms of age, it's about where they are in their development and an ADHD brain is going to develop differently than another child or a neurotypical brain. So it's about understanding, okay, first of all, I need to drop certain specific under, uh, expectations. And like D Dr. Shabali says, I need to parent the child that's in front of me, right? And so me with ADHD, my child having ADHD is going to look different than your child that has ADHD. And so I think that that's the first thing is that we need to be willing to parent the child that's in front of us. The second thing really is being willing to stop and if we don't take that pause for ourselves, if we don't see where our reactions are coming from, they are going to be caught up in fight or flight and they are going to be reactive. And it could look like the best tool that the best ADHD parenting coach gave you, but it's not going to translate that way. And then lastly, understanding what our specific child is needing, feeling, and believing in the moment and responding to that way. So if I did have an ADHD child that is what did you say? Like, no, you didn't say bouncing off the walls. You said being. Well, just, you know, really um, impulsive or, you know, a lot of ADHD. And I realize there's diff like seven different kinds of ADHD. So I don't want to generalize too much. But a lot of the hallmarks of ADHD are are impulsiveness and, you know, and, and not getting things done. And, you know, but it feels like that kind of aggressive saying things and doing things can be, you know, A, really triggering and B, really problematic. I mean, when I think about as a mom, you want to protect your kid and you want to make sure they don't get in trouble, right? So that, that you know, kind of that fear comes out. So yeah, I mean, um, but I, I feel like what I'm hearing you say, it's kind of back to the basics of show up as a wise, empathetic parent and meet them where they are, right? And I love Dr. Shafali as well, parent the kid that you have and like do your own work. Yeah, well, for me, that is the space that I spent so much time in, in the space of, well, what do I need to do in this situation? And what's the disciplinary action? And is it sticker charts? Is it this? Is it that? And where I am in this space right now in my parent coaching is that that matters far less than how you are experiencing your child. That matters far less than how you're seeing the label of ADHD. Meaning as the parent, like if you as the parent are thinking or not even thinking if you're feeling because that's even more kind of in that uh, limbic part of our brains, you're feeling afraid, you're feeling angry. Are you is that what you're saying that it really yes. comes back to where you are, where your perception is as a parent with your kid? Absolutely, because that's going to lead you to, again, use your disciplinary action as a way to soothe whatever is happening for you emotionally. Oh, my God. <laughs> All right. Well, I mean, yeah, in a way, it's. It, I feel like it's great news. Um, you know, when I think about my own life, when I think about other parents that 
that struggle and whether it's an ADHD label or, or you know, um, sort of formally diagnosed or just, I mean, let's face it, there's some pretty impulsive, uh, what do they call spirited kids out there? And Man. the idea of the, of we as parents, um, empowering ourselves and and you know bringing that locus of not even of control but like the agency of account <laughs> agency and accountability back inside rather than accidentally or unconsciously dumping it on our kids like that's something that i've struggled with quite honestly yeah and and you know so it's a just it's a wonderful reminder to say yeah it's, it starts with me and yet that can be tricky too because it's like oh man I got 52 years of unwinding to do to you know to try to do it um you know to to try to do it better so do you do you get pushback from other people in your family I mean do people like do you feel like you have to I can imagine there's people outside of your immediate sphere but do you feel like you're getting pushback from others on you know kind of a, a um, embracing this thing that's maybe a little bit different than what you know, they experienced or would expect of you? No, actually, not not so much anymore. I don't. And I think that the reason I don't is maybe because I don't invite it as much anymore. Um, I'm pretty sure and confident in what makes sense for myself, what makes sense for my daughter. Um, and so, no, I don't get that much pushback anymore. In fact, the relationships that maybe or the people that I would expect to have a hard time with it, I see the way that they interact with my children versus maybe the way that they interact with other children. And it's different. It, it's definitely different. They're typically a lot more open. I see the way that my children interact with them versus the way that other children interact with them as well. So, And um, what do you like... And I could see that. What do you feel like is the reason that you've gotten so big on TikTok and Instagram? Because on the one hand, there's a lot of pushback and at the same, maybe not a lot, but certainly pushback. And at the same time, what you're saying is really resonating. I mean, what do you attribute that to? Um, I think the biggest reason is because I share and it's very real and relatable stories. And so I can share what it actually looks like and show what it actually looks like. And I'm not just maybe just talking through this, the concepts and the way that we are right now. I also think because I'm not presenting this cookie cutter version of what gentle parenting looks like, which is kind of what was present in this space before. And I'm sh showing up and like committing to what Jai calls imperfect authenticity and being willing to say, this is how I course corrected. This is what I was doing wrong. This is how I navigated that situation. Uh, I think that that really resonates and lands with people. Yeah, no, it, it it certainly does. Like I said before, we got on uh, our, you know, I'm a huge fan, and our our team has been really excited to, you know, to follow you as well. Um, my co-host Joanna isn't here today because she's sick, but she had a burning question that I wanted to ask you. Um, she has two teens and a very young daughter, so her question is, what do you do when they're older? And the misbehavior goes from childlike to teen misbehavior that could hurt them or someone else. Like, what do you do if you find, if you keep finding vapes in one of their rooms? Oh, yeah. So first of all, you have to be willing to look at yourself and say, you know, how have I contributed? And what were the boundaries? Like, how did, how did we get here? How did we get here? Because if our children are not trusting our voice, that speaks to our level of parenting, number one, whether that was because they weren't open, um, there wasn't open communication, there was fear of punishment, whatever it was. <clears throat> number two, if we are willing to do repair, we have to acknowledge and accept the fact that maybe our voice isn't the one that they're going to listen to. And so that's why I think that community is important. I think that having therapists for our children is important a trusted adult that they can actually communicate with and talk to um, because you ultimately mean outside, that, of, uh, other than outside of ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Because ultimately the older that they get, the less agency we have over the situation and we cannot really force them to do things. And so I think that that's why relational safety is important in the beginning. And if that's not occurring and that's not happening, 
forcing our kids to do something the older they get is going to just continue to disrupt that that safety. And so that might look like a conversation and expressing the safety. Um, that might be uh, that might look like intentionally putting certain boundaries in the environment. But from my perspective, that would look like supporting them with the people that they actually trust to be mm-hmm. able to hear that message from. So like a coach or an aunt or an uncle, or maybe what we have found even in our family, other um, other parents, uh, friends. Yeah. You know, and I, I feel like we play these reciprocal roles. You know, I'm close to um, some of my my son's friends, right? And as, you know, just, it's like, it feels like kind of a, a really wonderful opportunity to um, to almost be like that auntie that loves them unconditionally and creates that safe space. And it's a different dynamic. Yeah. Well, the thing about it is, is that my daughter tries things. I encourage her to trust her voice. I encourage her to try things. And there will be things, there have been things that I don't necessarily agree with when I come and talk to her about safety or when I come and talk to her about my concern, there's trust there and there's understanding there. And that's because of the intention of create, creating that relational safety. And that's that's not something that you create in the teen years. Well, the, okay. So you just anticipated my question. You know, if, if a parent of a 14 year old is listening to this and is new to gentle parenting, what would you tell them? That you need to focus on relational safety. No, that, that, that is that. Yeah, exactly. That the focus needs to step back. Just like I had to do when I moved from permissive parenting, I really had to shift and focus on the boundary piece of it. And the, you know, um, and hang on, what do you mean by the boundary piece piece of it? So, so she didn't have, so they're right. So there were no boundaries. Like it was the wild, wild west, whatever. And so I had to say, Hey, I have not supported you up until this point because you didn't have any boundaries. And that's why you struggle with some things. That's why you're resistant to some things. That's not your fault. It's not because you're a bad kid or defiant. It's because you haven't had to. So this is difficult. So in order to support you, I'm still going to have relational safety, still going to care about your feelings, but I'm going to make sure that the environment is set up for you to succeed. The opposite is true of an authoritarian parent. Hey, we're still going to have boundaries and we're still going to have limits, but I'm actually going to listen to you. I'm going to stop cutting you off. I'm going to stop trying to fix you. The idea of getting in trouble and shaming you, that has to go away. I'm actually going to start collaborating with you. I'm going to stop raising my voice. I'm going to stop yelling. Because if there is a negative association with your parenting wisdom, they're not going to receive it. So if your 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 teaching comes through yelling, it it becomes through things that are intended to cause harm to your child. When they get older and they no longer have to receive it, they won't because it doesn't feel good for them to do that. And so they're going to look outside of you. And so you have to be willing to pause and take a step back and rebuild that emotional safety and that consistency. And you have to do that for a while. Mm-hmm. And I feel like it's like you've got permissive and then you've got authoritarian. Do you see are there instances I can think of even both, right? Where it's like you've got that, you know, that it's like no boundaries, but also a lot of, you know, trying to, um, you know, trying to um, um, put, you know, kind of put uh, consequences and punishments in place. Do you see that as well? Yeah, absolutely. That's the majority of what I see. And the goal is kind of to try to bring parents into the middle, which is that more authoritative parenting where it's like, this is the expectation, but I'm also going to support you in that expectation. Like, yes, you're 11. I expect you to clean your room. And at the same time, I don't expect you to just know what that means. My support looks like here's a checklist. My support looks like I'm setting a timer. My support looks like I'm going to come in and compassionately check on you. I'm not going to come in here and be a jerk and yell at you because you're not done. So it has to be a both and. Oh, yeah. I mean, it. I feel like to have that consistency, it, you know, and, and to your point, like to say it's not just I'm, I'm going to expect you to show up and and just know what to do. It's, you know, it's really trying to give them those tools, which, yeah. you know, it, it, it makes a lot of sense. Destiny Ann, we're just about to wrap up. What haven't I asked you that 
is burning for you to share with our guests or the number one thing that you would like um, parents who want to be as successful as they possibly can? What should they know that I didn't that we didn't talk about? Yeah, I mean, we covered so many things. I think that the important piece of it kind of that I just want to wrap up with is that it's not so much about the tools. I, I encourage parents to continue to research the tools and to find the podcast books and all of that things. But until we are willing to be more self-aware of what our triggers are, of how our, what our children's behaviors are waking up in us in the moment, it's not going to be effective in the way that we desire. For me, effective is I see growth in my child, but I also see growth in our relationship. Neither can be a priority. And unless we are willing to look within, one is going to get prioritized over the other. Permissive parents are only going to prioritize the relationship and authoritarian parents are only going to uh, prioritize their children's behaviors changing. And so it has to be a both and. Yeah. It, well, it's a really wonderful note to end on. And I guess I'd like to add to that in enjoying your book so much when you talk about um, like a joy rampage and you, you know, yeah. you, you, you've given yourself a lot of credit and rightfully so. And it just, it's a reminder, I think, to everybody, to all parents, we are, so many of us are so hard on ourselves. Mm -hmm. And going back to the beginning of our conversation, when I think about the work you've done through the Jai Institute and so forth about, you know, starting with, with us and putting those um, awareness glasses on. So that's great. But I also want to, you know, somebody, I'm also really hard on myself. Um, so, you know, for, for all the moms and dads out there that are at least like, like me, I just want to say, can we all just give ourselves a little more credit and a little more mm -hmm. of a break, right? Because mm -hmm. I do think there is a, uh, and you write about this, the connection between how we treat ourselves and, you know, kind of the energy that we're creating inside of ourselves is directly, you know, felt and, and um, experienced by our, our kids, you know, and it's like, we're all trying to, you know, make money and take care of them and cook healthy food and all the, you know, all the, the things that make modern parenting for most of us, um, for the vast majority of us, it's a lot. Yeah. And so I just, I do appreciate your reminder to, um, to give ourselves maybe a, a little bit, you know, more credit and, you know, to kind of cultivate that, that joy. I feel like joy is an overlooked um, virtue. So thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Destiny Ann Davis, you can find her amazing presence on TikTok and Instagram, her beautiful book, Very Intentional Parenting, her amazing TED Talk, uh, No Bad Kids, and um, and more. Um, Destiny Ann, thank you so much. I really enjoyed our conversation, and I look forward to having you back on Open Relationships. Thank you. I would love to come back. Thank you so much. So, okay. Um, wow. Uh, I just love Destiny Ann. She's so wise and so, like, just so um, poised and gracious. Do you have a, I realize you're not a parent yet, uh, Brian, but is there a, a, a takeaway that you feel like is applicable to your life? Or I don't know if you're a, an uncle or, you know, if you have other kids in your no, life I, that you can. I don't uh, really kind of... have kids. Okay. But yeah, I, I definitely did like a lot of um, the stuff about, uh, going from the black sheep to the golden sheep. I definitely um, had that sort of mentality a lot. And then there was also oh, a point growing in time up where yourself? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You were the black uh, sheep? Oh my God, yeah. I mean, my Brian? my family is- What? Well, my, my family is very like, uh, very straightforward in that like, sister's a lawyer, like um, dad and mom wanted me to be an engineer because I was good at math and science and everything. Yeah. But I was like, I want to be an artist, you know, or whatever. And, and you want to be a drummer and yeah. Totally. Yeah, exactly. Um, but so- uh, mm, I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, just to no, feel like that feeling, well, it's fine now, but I mean, that feeling of you've disappointed people, that's a burden. Oh yeah, no. Uh, when I when I was in college, I my first two years were in computer engineering, and then I actually switched without telling my family um, into digital media and um, uh, like interactive entertainment, and I started doing that stuff and just didn't tell my family for. Oh like my a god! Year. Wow, um, rebel. <laughs> yeah, well, and then I ended up getting 
um, a couple good like jobs and I started like filming and editing uh, commercials like locally and everything. And um, I got to a point where I was like, I had like a career going and I was like, hey, so don't be mad at me. I'm not an engineer, but I do have a career. So mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, but yeah, that must have um, been, I mean, I feel like to it's a burden to carry a secret like that and to feel like you can't be seen and you have to kind of keep something um, under. Wraps. Oh, yeah. Oh, I mean, like my family was definitely like um, not happy about it and would try and get me to go back and everything and it wasn't it wasn't until i'm not going to say the name of the show but i i moved yeah. to new york to work on a very very large show mm -hmm. and it wasn't until i was on that show my name was in the credits and like you know you could see me behind the scenes stuff it was like that's when my family was finally like oh okay we don't need to like like try and worry about you you know or whatever mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. oh yeah. okay so you got outside validation oh i mean which is good and bad kind of thing right yeah well yeah exactly i was I, that's what i mean though is that like i was definitely the black sheep of like the oh what's that guy doing over there like mm -hmm. he's gonna go like make art you had a whole promising thing that you're throwing away mm -hmm. or whatever and then it's like and now everyone's like oh hey so can we get tickets to that show in oh. new york whatever <laughs> mm. Exactly. Well, that is, that's funny. Well, I mean, good for you. I'm honestly, I just feel like so much of this stuff, it's like we as parents, we do our best and often we fall short, right? And and it really is from a place of, ooh, we think we know better. And then we, we, we screwed up. So I feel like it's just this collective, at least for me, you know, when I think about talking to people like Destiny Ann, it's like, how can we just continue to become more aware and, you know, and that I feel like and then being willing to when we become more aware, being willing to look at ourselves and say, OK, maybe I don't know what's best. Right. And that I feel like coming from that place of humbleness is a really, really good place um, for our kids, because so often, you know, you as a parent, you just feel like, but I know better. Right. And, and my intention is to protect them. Right. And so, be, you know, typically an engineer, or, you know, uh, lawyer, those professions are a little bit safer and make more money. And those are the things that so often we we as parents value. But then it's like, no, like, hey, Brian, you know, we trust you to follow your heart and, you know, and do what, what you love. So it's a good, you know, it's a good reminder. OK, did yeah, you have that sort of? Oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I was going to say it, it kind of ties in with her other thing of um, the parenting the child you have, which I know you're familiar with that concept as well. A hundred percent. Yeah, like, cause, cause that's the thing too is like, I, I think I was being parented as the, the child they assumed they had, or the or the child that they you know quote unquote wanted, or or what they wanted for the kid. But it's like, no, 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 this is what your child wants. How do you, you know, like work with your child? Yeah, yeah, I I agree. I feel like that can't be emphasized enough. Um, meeting them where they are. And just having a, a real, I mean, you know, you, I, I have said it many times, I always think of my boys as my Buddhas. And they show, our kids show us ourselves like nobody else. And so, you know, it's like back to, you know, parenting the kids you have. It's also like um, seeing your own blind spots and seeing where you have unresolved hurt and heartache and how you can, um, you know, effectively reparent yourself. So, you know, not fun, <laughs> you know, but it's the <laughs> right thing. And, you know, it is. I mean, it's like, it's the, the, the way to heal. Like, rather than just sweeping under the rug and saying, I just don't, you know, I just don't want to deal with it. It's like, well, okay, but whatever, you know, I love the phrase, whatever we resist persists. So, yeah, it's true. You know, it's like, oh, I don't want to look at that. I'm just going to sweep, sweep, sweep it under the rug. You know, it, I was, oh, I was telling my son the other day about the princess and the pea. He's like, no, nope, never heard of it. He's like, what's that story? <laughs> and then I'm like, well, there's a princess and there's a pea of like a frozen pea at the bottom of like 50 mattresses and she can feel it when she sleeps. And that's all I can remember. <laughs> He's like, oh, great story. <laughs> like, I don't know. You know, feeling the pee under 50 mattresses like it's there. But it does kind of feel like it's those emotional wounds that it's like, you know, we we feel them whether we, you know, want to admit it to ourselves or not. Yeah. Um. What is my favorite takeaway? I think, Um. well, I just I love the story. I Probably the thing that I loved was 
what she was able to do to transform her relationship with her dad and to say, yeah. I'll quit being the bad kid or the black sheep if you uh, quit being the, you know, the bad parent. And I feel like that takes a lot of guts. And yeah, I can't believe she said that. That was awesome. <laughs> yeah. Snap, sister. Um, when I think about it's not just the words, like when I think of her intention and her having done her, I mean, what seems like her having done her own work so she can say that in a way that didn't alienate him, but left let him off the hook and could really change the dynamic in their relationship. And I feel like that's available to all of us. Right. So, I mean, in part, it's, to me, yeah. it's a universal story. Um, a lot of people um, still feel so much, so many misgivings toward their parents and that just feels like a an unnecessary burden that um that we can um put down right i mean i've had to go through a lot of that i mean i haven't had the exact conversation with my parents but enough of the showing up and and loving them as they are and knowing that they always did what you know the best that they could it's enabled me to to show up and really create a very um loving different dynamic in our relationship, but it's also, but it's been, it's been on me, <laughs> right? I mean, so when I think about, wow, my relationship with my parents has transformed, it's like, well, you know, because I'm not showing up and um, feeling um, angry, right? Or, or, right. or, you know, blame and judgment. Resentful. So, yeah. Just a, a profound reminder. And, you know, I like how she even said, you know, her kids, what, people notice what they notice about her kids and I, I guess that's the other thing I just love how she said she was going through all the mechanical processes and by the time her daughter was seven she she was trying so hard to show up differently than how she was parented and she realized she needed to change and yep. um, that to me it's like I, that's probably like the most radical and obvious um, outcome of, of this discussion. And I feel like just about any, it's like, you know, change starts with me. It's like, I yeah. want to change um, and have a, a, a more beautiful relationship or a transformed relationship with anybody. You know, my husband and I always talk about like when you're pointing at somebody, you've got uh, four, at least three, <laughs> at least three pointing yeah. back at you. It's like one, you know, your thumb, unless you're like, depending on how you do with the thumb. Yeah. 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 <laughs> exactly. Three pointing back at you. So Oh my gosh. Uh, thank you for tuning in to another amazing episode of Open Relationships Transforming Together. I would love your feedback or advice. Our email is openrelationships at your tango.com. I'd be super grateful if you followed us on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, wherever you get your podcasts. And I would love for you to share comments, what you think about the show on any of those platforms. Your tuning in means the world to us, you know, to me, to Brian, to Joanna, to our entire team. We are um, so passionate about bringing the show to you and any feedback, questions, guests, any ideas you may have would be amazing. So, um, so please uh, do, uh, do let us know what you think. Uh, thanks very much. And we'll see you back here soon.